Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. We'll be hearing from Gretchen Newberry about her research with common nighthawks. My name is Robin Bailey. I'm the project leader for the Cornell Lab's Nestwatch program, and I will be facilitating today's conversation. Today's webinar is hosted in Ithaca, New York. I would like to read a statement acknowledging the indigenous people as the original inhabitants of this area. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gaia Kono people. The Gaia Kono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gaia Kono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gaia Kono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. A couple of technical notes for our audiences on Zoom and YouTube. Closed captioning is available on Zoom. If you'd like to turn captions on or off, please click the captions button at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see a caption button, click the three dots that say more. For those watching on YouTube, you can click the CC button at the bottom of the video to turn on the captions. To ask our panel questions, um, please use the Q&A feature. Um, if you don't know where the Q&A feature is, look at the bottom of the Zoom panel and don't use the chat for the questions. We won't be monitoring the chat, so please use the Q&A button to type your question. Please only use the Zoom chat for technical support. If you're watching on YouTube and you'd like to ask the panel a question, you'll need to subscribe to the Cornell Labs YouTube channel. Click the subscribe button under the video. If you're not logged in with a Google account, you'll be prompted to sign in first. My colleagues will be helping to answer questions and share information in the chats for both Zoom and YouTube. Okay, let's get started. Welcome, Gretchen. Um, one of the reasons I invited Gretchen to speak to us today about common nighthawks is because they are a type of specialized forager called aerial insectivores. This just means that they primarily eat insects on the wing, similar to swallows, swifts, and martins. As we'll learn about in a short while, many species in this group have been exhibiting population declines over the past several decades. Crepuscular and nocturnal aerial insectivores are even less understood than their daytime counterparts, which is why we're so lucky to have Gretchen here to help shed some light on this subject. Gretchen Newberry earned a PhD in biology from the University of South Dakota, where she studied common nighthawks. While earning her degree, she started writing The Nighthawks Evening, a book about the bird, the aerial insectivore guild, and the hidden world of nocturnal animals. She now promotes biodiversity and maintains a personal blog called A Feathered Reptile. Thank you for joining us, Gretchen, and take it away. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to give this talk for um, Cornell. I'm really impressed by their work with outreach on so many things. And so uh, I am going to share my screen here before I forget. All right. And switch over to my talk. Yeah, so I studied Nighthawks for six years in South Dakota. I went there to study Nighthawks in grasslands. I am from originally Minnesota and I love grasslands. And what's interesting about, um, about the grasslands in Eastern South Dakota and Minnesota where I grew up is those grasslands are disappearing. And so my study became about something different. And I think kind of something more interesting as I hopefully you'll see. So this is the call of the Nighthawk. Um, maybe you've heard this call around sunset. Um, I've heard from people who hear it a lot that it keeps them up at night. You might see this in urban areas, beaches, open forests, southeast, um, in the Pine Barrens in New Jersey is sort of a famous place for them, or in the sagebrush out west but maybe less and less as the years go by, especially in the East. Oops, my videos are always tricky. There we go. 
These are migrating nighthawks in Wisconsin, where I used to live. Uh, this is along the Mississippi River. You see them flying during the day. Um, so enormous flocks uh, travel down the Mississippi River every year. So why are they called nighthawks if they can fly during the day? Well, they are mostly active around sunset, but they are neither strictly nocturnal nor a hawk, that's for sure. And it's becoming less common. So the common nighthawk really has one of the worst names ever. So if they're not a hawk, what are they? They are a member of the nightjar order. Oops, I think I skipped this one. Here we go. This is the nightjar order <laughs> uh, in cartoon form. Uh, so the nightjar order is no named Capromogaforms. That's Latin for goat sucker. And they were named for a legend that said they drank milk from livestock. And people might not have known what these birds were. They saw them only in the dark. They were eating insects that really may have been vectors for disease for their livestock. So um, while they may have been part of a, a legend, they are often misunderstood, um, the nightjars. So what are the nightjars here in the U.S.? We have the Eastern Whippoorwill, the Chuck Will, Chuck Will's Widow, the Common Poor Will, Lesser Nighthawk in the Southwest. So they are a nighthawk, but they're concentrated on desert areas. Um, they're a little smaller, um, like a lot of hot, hotter uh, environment animals are. They're a little smaller. Uh, the Common Nighthawk and then the Antillean Nighthawk lives um, really in the um, in the Caribbean, and it will sometimes visit Florida. So I included it here. And I should say the common poor will um, is the first, um, was first described in writing by Lewis and Clark. Uh, they are the only bird that hibernates in the world that we know of. <laughs> and other birds, uh, we have the Mexican whippoorwill and the common para K. Uh, these are found in southern Texas and New Mexico. So where is the common nighthawk? Uh, they are found coast to coast, less and less in some areas, as, as you can see there in white. Uh, in blue, those are places where they are increasing as of 2015, and in red, those are places where they're decreasing. So overall, they're down by 60% since the 1960s, and that's typical for a lot of birds. This is breeding bird survey data. So this is the bird I studied in South Dakota, where they use uh, open forests along the river and uh, also uh, some pine forests in the Black Hills. They also use sandbars in the Missouri River. They use urban areas and they use grasslands. And, and so night jars are really found all over the world. Um, there are 96 species of them. Most of them live in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, all but the nighthawks are completely night nocturnal. Um, other notable night jars of the world um, include this guy. This is the great eared night jar, which gets a lot of attention on social media. This is a really funny little uh, uh, drawing that birds and shoes made for Instagram. Um, and, and I think he this bird really inspires a lot of people, but I also think it was inspired, uh, inspired perhaps this animal, uh, <laughs> Toothless from How to Train Your Dragon. It, it seems so similar to me. I can't help but wonder if they were inspired by nightjars. Their nightjars had that sort of flattened face and big eyes. So the great-eared nightjar, uh, it lives in India and Indonesia. It is the largest of the family at 12 to 16 inches long. It's a pretty cute bird. Um, let's see if this video works. There he goes. Hey, Gretchen, I just wanted to pop on and say that the sound isn't being shared. Oh, it isn't? No, so maybe if you stop sharing screen and pop it back up and hit the share sound, we might be able to troubleshoot that. I am so sorry about that. That's okay. The audience just really wants to hear the bird. <laughs> I 
say that again. Oh, you know what? Now I can't click those buttons. The share sound and optimize video clip are not. Oh, darn. Yeah. OK, so I, I'm i going to share anyway. I'll put the links into the chat, Gretchen, so people can hear the sound on their own, OK? Yeah, and I would also say that I have a YouTube page where um, you can um, see all these clips. So if you search for me on YouTube, you'll you'll see them. So we'll we'll breeze past this guy. For some reason this bar for zoom is in my way. Okay, here we go. Okay, so also we have the common put to. Um, I recommend following the nightjar hashtag it in whatever social media you use. Uh, it's on, not only fun stuff like this, like the Kamen Putu, which looks like a Muppet, right? Um, but the beautiful diversity of night jars all, all over the world. Um, so, uh, he also has a pretty weird call, that Kamen Putu. And he's not an owl. Uh, that video describes it as a Putu owl. Anyway, so back to night jars. I'm sorry, back to nighthawks. <clears throat> so they can live in prairies. So that's the lower left on your screen, open forests on the upper left. That was taken by a colleague of mine, Ellie Knight, in the boreal forests um, in Canada. Open for forests like that uh, on beaches even, that's on the upper right. And then they are also ground nesters. But most of my research was on rooftops in places where they can't find an open ground. So that lower right picture is something I took on a rooftop. Um, this is a pair that I studied on a hospital roof in a small town in South Dakota. Uh, but they can use rooftops anywhere as long as they are flat and have gravel to disguise the eggs. So um, that's the male that's flying up ahead. And then that is the female down in the gravel. Uh, so you can see the male has that big white throw patch, but it also has those uh, white uh little bits on his tail feathers. So that that identifies the male. So this is me doing uh, some surveys on these rooftops. And what's interesting is when you do these surveys, you're, you're walking along and all the gravel looks alike. And then all of a sudden you see this skittering of feathers across the rooftop. And you might be tempted to follow those feathers, but really what you have to do is train your eye on exactly where they came from, because that is where the eggs are. So on the left, that's me um, approaching a nighthawk. That's about as close as I ever got uh, to one before it flew away. Okay, so, Um, I should say that, that a lot of time people didn't know that they had nighthawks on their roof. They were so great at camouflage, and they tend to only come out at sunset. So part of my work was explaining what a nighthawk was. And so which makes me think of nighthawks in art. So they nested on rooftops, they came out at sunset, and they hang around downtown. Maybe you've seen this painting before. This is by Edward Hopper called The Nighthawks. Maybe people saw these birds flying around bars and restaurants and started naming their bars and restaurants after them. Just a thought. So a lot of cities all over the world have bars named the Nighthawk or the Nightjar. I visited one in London in Soho. So perhaps people once knew these birds better once when they were more numerous in towns and then named their bars after them. Incidentally, Hopper painted this at the beginning of World War II as an homage to the nightlife that he missed when blackouts had started. I find that really poignant. I know I missed going out at night and during the height of the pandemic. Um, so it's quite poignant that this painting uh, describes a bird and a place um, all at night, sort of a, a longing for a more lively nightlife. And I think that's kind of interesting thought about nighthawks. So back to biology. Why do they like gravel? They they need the camouflage for their eggs and chicks. They And while I'm talking, you can try to find the eggs and chicks in these pictures here. They don't make a nest, and so they need to stay with their young for thermal regulation. The eggs and chicks 
uh, need their parents. Um, they don't have a feathered nest to keep them warm. Um, and staying camouflage keeps the adults, eggs, and chicks hidden during the day. Here they are in case you miss them. That's the chicks on the right, a bit of fluff, and then the little round stones there on the left. Roofs are hot. So when it's 90 degrees Fahrenheit on the ground, it's 120 degrees Fahrenheit on the roof. Um, night jars are drawn to heat. They are second to pigeons and doves in terms of heat tolerance among the bird orders. So these chicks here on the right are three or four days old. And in my study on these rooftops, only 10% of my roofs survived, sorry, only 10% of my nests survived from egg to fl fledgling. Most died as eggs, but many died in the first one to two days um, of life before they could walk to shade. So these birds are considered semi-precocial. They, um, they're not as naked at hatching as songbirds are, but they're not ready to run uh, like a crane. So they're somewhere in between. Um, so they, this is this is probably true of a lot of uh, ground nesting birds in terms of their vulnerability in an open habitat, like beaches, rooftops, grassland. They are vulnerable as eggs and especially um, in the first couple of days when they are chicks. So they need minimal disturbance uh, to survive. Um, and if, if you flush the parents, that's time away that they could be keeping their chicks cool. So they are generalist in theory because they can live in a lot of habitats, but they're becoming more and more of a specialist in their habitat. They like forests, but um, a lot of those are disappearing. They like beaches, but those are getting crowded with tourism and dogs off leash and those sorts of things. They like grassland, but we like to plow over grasslands and grow row crops. And they like gravel rooftops, but we are starting to remove those gravel from the rooftops and and those rooftops are getting really hot even for a heat tolerant bird like a nighthawk so don't lose hope uh, you can see them in lots of places this is um Malheur national wildlife refuge near where i live in portland oregon um, there there are lots of good places to see them if you like to bird and you visit Malheur, you will see lots of them in the wetlands, scooping up insects, great clouds of them during the day sometimes, and probably nesting in their surrounding sagebrush. Uh, that's the first place I ever saw one. Uh, eBird, of course, is a great tool for finding nighthawks. And if you stay at the Malheur field station, they will be resting on the trailer railings during the day. Um, so here's where they are observed in the breeding bird survey. The redder areas are where um, they spotted more nighthawks in the first two and a half hour, sorry, within the two and a half hour period of the survey. So lots of nighthawks in those south central plains. Um, and then in sagebrush areas, those are sort of um, hot spots for nighthawks. And they like it in Florida apparently too. So. Um, here's sort of an interesting kind of tip for finding urban nighthawks. This is eBird uh, data. So this is La Crosse, Wisconsin, where I used to live. And you can see these are urban areas and they're spotted. You can see where people had spotted them. But when, the, when you zoom in, you notice there's some large flat rooftops and these lighter gray or beige rooftops um, have gravel on them. Those darker gray, that's a different material. So you can kind of scope that out and then go back to that same spot over and over again all summer, you know, during June and July when they breed and see that same nighthawk calling over that same rooftop every night if the weather's right. Um, so they like hospitals, schools, strip malls, really old strip malls, um, box stores if they're old. Um, and if they're nesting there, you, you might see them. Uh, they had, do have one of the shortest breeding seasons of, the, of any bird. They tend to arrive late May, and then they start leaving in August. All right, cool facts about nighthawks. They have really short legs, and so they walk around really clumsy like this. Um, that in, they're, they're just not built for walking. Um, they are built to fly, and they eat insects, which allows them to eat while they migrate. 
It's a feast or famine kind of life. Big payoffs for big gambles, but without a constant supply of food, they are pretty vulnerable like a lot of insect eaters, like bats, which bats are really vulnerable um, to dis winter diseases like white nose syndrome, and that's wiping out entire species. But yeah, so that constant uh, food, without a constant supply of food, which seems to be ephemeral with the weather, um, that, that makes them vulnerable at times. So um, what you don't hear <laughs> is at the bottom of that dive, there was a whirring sound. And, and that is where they spread their feathers and uh, wind rushes through their feathers. And so this is called a boom call. And they use this to... to uh, establish their territory. They might boom call over and over and over and over again. And some, some people think that both males and females do this. Um, but, and, to, and I mentioned the, the sort of challenge of a ground nesting bird is that if they are disturbed too much, that means they have to lure the predator away from their chicks. That's time that they lose helping their chicks stay cool. And their chicks are more exposed to the weather than cavity or tree nesters, and they are especially vulnerable in the first couple of days because um, they're not mobile enough to find sh shade or sun to counteract the sun, wind, or rain, or whatever the case may be. In addition, every instance of stress due to interaction with a predator, whether that's um, people or your very friendly dog, uh, activates their, their stress hormone uh, system. So it activates the hippocampus and then that sends a signal to the pituitary and the adrenal stress hormone pathway that diverts resources from building fat and tissues to grow strong enough to fly away and live independently for a few weeks until they have to migrate to South America. Everything's on a very short timeline with nighthawks. They live on the wing. They don't have a lot of time for this. So um, what they do have a lot of is a lot of attitude. Uh, they have puny bills and claws, so even their chicks have to have a lot of attitude if they're discovered. Um, but they don't they don't have any weapons to back that up. Have you noticed that big mouth? Uh, he's built to fly around and eat, and he has that big mouth to dissipate heat. So a lot of cooling uh, air can move through that big mouth of his and help him stay cool. So he's pretty great at it, and even if he's struggling, it's, it's kind of weird. Um... Let's see. So females can be a little aggressive in their own way at the nest. This one is uh, sort of making a rasping, a clicking, and a squeaking noise all at one. She was doing this repeatedly while I was measuring her chicks. Um, and they like to use this broken wing routine to sort of attract my attention, like the kill deer neighbors that they have. Um, they also like to lure people away. So she just moves like a little bit away and wants to attract my attention away from her eggs. Um, it's pretty effective. I mean, who wouldn't want to follow that around? Um, they have a pretty interesting social life, like this bird. So this is a male on a rooftop. He sat in that same spot for four years. It came back every year, sat in the same spot. Uh, he watched, he lived on a very large roof. This is where he sat. Uh, he's very vigilant. He sometimes met me at the parking lot and let me know that he was not happy to see me. Um, this is a, a, a school. So there are a lot of students running around during the summer doing sports and he, he didn't care about them, but he knew me because I'm the person who comes on the roof and harasses his birds, his females and his chicks. So um, it's pretty interesting that he recognized me every time. Uh, so this is where he sat which is there. This is the roof. This is Elk Point Jefferson Elementary School in South Dakota. That's where he sat every year. These were his females on the first year. Uh, and then on the second year, they like to use the same spot over and over again. And then on the third year. So interestingly enough, this one on the lower left, that's uh, an interesting bird I called Lady Sisyphus. She never hatched an egg in the years that I studied them. Um, perhaps because she was pretty far away from the males. She, he, he didn't really, he really couldn't keep track of what was going on with her. That, that 
structure in the middle is pretty tall, actually. Um, so, and it's possibly because also there may have been a sneaker male who kept distracting her from hatching the first male's eggs. So this is her, and then this other male shows up, and and then she would abandon her eggs and try again with him, and there wouldn't be enough time, and those eggs wouldn't work out either. This happened over and over again for four years. So sneaker males are really interesting in ecology, and the classic study are elephant seals. So here we have this big male and a big harem, right? And then another male shows up and wants to fight. And that while that's going on, this guy shows up. I mean, look at him. He's pretty sneaky looking. Um, interestingly enough, this only works out like 10% of the time. So the sneaker male, you know, like 10% of the time manages to mate with a female. And, um, and then she'll like give up on her uh, young and start up with this new guy. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty good gamble. Like he doesn't do any work. He just shows up and does this. And so a lot of that was happening with Nighthawks. So here, the, here's another pair. She was on a, on a set of eggs and then this male shows up and then she abandons that. So it happened a couple times at least. But males are really beneficial to Nighthawks. So here we have the male with the big white throat patch. Excuse the morning dove that um, is in so many of these pictures. Um, but so yeah, here's the male who's keeping cozy with the female who is thermoregulating the chick. So, you know, he's, he's, he's really effective at, you know, keeping them together. Um, but not only that, but he will also incubate the eggs. This is a female on some eggs and the male shows up and then she can take off and eat for a while. So he, he can incubate eggs. Some males don't do any of that. They just move around from roof to roof and do a little bit of work here and there. Um, but they will also feed chicks. So here's the male with the big white throat patch feeding the little fuzzy pointed thing that's a chick while the female is sitting over here. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned that the, the success rate for these nests was 10%. And when a male was present, that went up to 50%. So uh, having a male around was really a, a good thing for Nighthawks. So I mentioned that these rooftops are going away. So this bottom this is a rooftop that was in the middle of transitioning from one rooftop type to another so on the bottom is the gravel that's classic and then uh that middle uh rooftop is the rubberized structure underneath that gravel so the gravel's meant to keep that rubberized part down from flying up in the wind and, and uh, you know protects that part and then that top white roof is what people are moving toward the sort of plastic uh, white canvas material. And this white plasticized canvas material at the top has the potential to be more energy efficient. So I can't really blame people for wanting to do this. I mean, can you imagine trying to haul a bunch of gravel onto a rooftop? It's I've seen it done and it's really a, quite a production. So interesting strategies. Here's the New Hampshire Audubon Society. They went out and found some rooftops that had been converted and they sent out teams of volunteers to rooftops to put out small gravel patches. And sometimes the Nighthawks didn't use, show up. Um, and then sometimes if they did, there would be a predator because there was this weird thing going on, this weird gravel patch that wasn't there. And um, it, Nighthawks have all kinds of predators, and um, most of it is seagulls and crows, um, you know, the usual suspects. But these volunteers are still working on the problem, so perhaps they have better solutions than work. I don't, I don't want to dismiss their work. It's, I applaud their effort for sure. Okay, so Nighthawks are considered aerial insectivores. These are animals that fly around and eat insects. So you can see swallows, swifts, and bats in this group. And that's their guild. So a guild is a group of animals that make their living in a similar way. And I made this drawing back in um, in Wisconsin when I, I lived along the Mississippi River. And so this is sort of the ecosystem of why aerial insectivores matter. So you have leaf litter that comes down from the tree that feeds invertebrates that um, feed emerging insects and also fish and turtles and uh, and and those emerging insects feed the aerial insectivores, and then um, those fish feed, you know, a great blue heron who then drops uh, fish matter on the on the on the banks, which then in turn fertilizes the trees. So it's all part of this ecosystem. Aerial insectivores uh, they don't live in a vacuum. 
Uh, they are the fastest dwindling guild of birds in the world. This is why I keep talking about them. So that lavender line, those are the aerial insectivores. And then the next line up is this mustard colored line. And those are the grassland birds. And nighthawks are members of both of those guilds. So, um, but they do have a superpower. They can withstand a lot of heat. They do this by panting and entering torpor. So that's a shortened version of hibernation. Um, all the nightjars really um, use torpor, this sort of shortened version of hibernation in which they lower their metabolism. Sometimes they match their body temperature to the environment so there's no heat loss or exchange. Um, and then they hunker down until there's like food to eat. So they might do this during a thunderstorm or they might do this when it's extremely hot. Um, you know, so if these champions of thermoregulation are struggling, what does that say about less heat tolerant organisms in hotter environments? So this graph is um, the anomalies in temperature and the upper left is North America. Um, Lower left is Europe, lower right is Asia, upper right is Africa. And you can see the Americas are not experiencing as extreme uh, anomalies as other parts of the world. So nighthawks live, breed in the Americas. Um, and, and so if they're struggling in the heat and they're extremely heat tolerant, it's just a whole lot of cascade of questions that I have about the rest of the world and the rest of the organisms. Um, so what can we do? We can do a lot of things. So these are ground nesting birds. We can keep our pets from roaming freely. Uh, these are my cats in South Dakota that I used to take out on a leash. They didn't love it, but I knew that they uh, were cold blooded killers. <laughs> Straight up. Uh, so lots of critters live on the ground, including nighthawk chicks that recently fledged. So I, I worked in an urban environment with a lot of feral cats. And I, I, I worried about the chicks that would fledge to the ground. Uh, we can also uh, spread awareness about uh, ground nesting birds. This is a campaign by the Audubon Society at the National Wildlife Refuges on the East Coast on behalf of shorebirds. So this is a really interesting sign. It's saying, hey, we, we love dogs and we get that even your friendly dog can frighten birds, sadly. Um, and here's a QR code to show you where there are uh, off-leash areas that you can take your dog. Because uh, we all love dogs, right? Uh, this is really interesting. So this is the Thames Basin Heath Partnership in, out of uh, London, UK. So Europ European uh, nightjars nest in heath. Um, that's like their version of grasslands. Um, and uh, in the US, we're not super aware about ground nesting nightjars, but they are super aware, uh, or at least they're trying really hard. Uh, in my book, I talk about the efforts to protect nighthawks in on British Columbia beaches, but this is pretty cool too. So they have signs asking folks to keep their dogs leashed on behalf of the night jars uh, that nest on the heath. They also lead night jar walks, which I would love to go to. Um, no one's ever led a night jar walk to my knowledge. Uh, I'm sure there are people elsewhere in the world. Night jars are everywhere. But uh, anyway, I would love to go sometime in the summer and see this night jar walk. So they do this at night so people can see them in action. So if you're in London during the some summer, I recommend looking these folks up. They're on Instagram. This is uh, Senior Warden Zoe putting up signs. They have uh, multiple wardens and a lot of uh, great infographics about ground nesting birds. They not only have night jars, they have uh, warblers and woodlarks and um, and their logo is a night jar. So who, who can say no to that? Uh, other things we can do, we can create eco roofs. So these are green roofs. And I like this one um, because it has gravel and as well as some greenery to keep the roof cool. So uh, not only nighthawks use rooftops, but killdeer. And where I live in the Willamette Valley in Oregon, both nighthawks and killdeer are species of concern for the state um, Department of Wildlife. So and 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 the fact that they're both on that list says a lot about grassland being gone and then these birds moving onto rooftops to replace that grassland habitat. We can also, <clears throat> excuse me, conserve habitat when we can. This is a map of the Missouri River where I studied uh, nighthawks. In the 1890s, uh, that upper 
uh, map. That's the 1890s with lots of um, sandbar and uh, that light beige grassland and green and then the forest and dark green. And then the the lower map is the 1950s onward. That dark beige or darker beige, that is row crop agriculture. So you can see uh, what is happening to grasslands in a lot of areas. Um, another thing you can do is buy duck stamps. Um, because of the ethanol boom in the decade from 2000 to 2010, we lost the equivalent in North America of the size of Kansas. So I'll say that again. We lost Kansas in terms of grassland in 10 years uh, in North America. Um, so while I was studying nighthawks, I was trying to study them in grasslands, but they really weren't there anymore because they uh, disappeared from Eastern South Dakota where I lived and was studying them. Western South Dakota is a very different story, lots of grasslands. Um, so it's really interesting. So duck stamps, what that does is when I, when I was at University of South Dakota, I volunteered for the National Wildlife Refuge System and the refuge manager said, all of a sudden during this ethanol boom, uh, the prices of corn went sky, uh, suddenly dropped, it, overproduction, and then people were trying to get rid of row crop areas that could then be converted back to grassland or at least wetland. And so they were just dying for them to become um, easements. So a lot of those easements were paid for with duck stamp money. Um, so these duck stamps can be bought at your local National Wildlife Refuge. Every year, the Fish and Wildlife Service holds a contest for artists to paint the duck stamp and has a junior contest for kids too. So one fell swoop, you can support art and conservation. Uh, go check them out at your local wildlife refuge. Um, so why is migration so important in the middle of the country? Well, this is a study um, by my colleague, Ellie Knight. She led a team of Nighthawk researchers all over North America. We put satellite transmitters on birds in Florida and Alberta and Saskatchewan, Ontario, Nevada, New Jersey, and the West Coast birds traveled over the Rockies and joined up with the Central Plains birds. So that prairie pothole region in the middle of the country is super important for migrating birds, including nighthawks. So we often think about waterfall, but lots of birds use this central corridor to, to migrate. And these migration sites are so important. Uh, one spring, a third of the nighthawks in my study didn't return. Uh, migration mortality is a great unknown for many birds. Lots of, you know, lack of stopover points could be a reason why. Um, coincidentally, if you want to see a nighthawk show, check out the nighthawk and other hawk migration in Duluth, Minnesota during the fall migration at Hawk Ridge. You'll see thousands of birds every day. Also, we can keep an eye on pesticide use. Lots of it ends up in wetlands. The nursery, you know, these are nurseries for the insects that nighthawks eat. Um, a lot of it is runoff from our um, urban areas. There's lots of alternatives to pesticide use. Um, insects serve as an important base for an ecosystem, and pesticides don't really differentiate between insects, whether they're beneficial or pests. So uh, with that, um, I want to thank you all for having me and for coming. I'm super excited that I got to talk about Nighthawks. Um, I have a book. It's available in bookstores, libraries, and on Kindle here in Portland. Uh, it's sold in the, Powell, the Big Powell's Bookstore here in Portland who filed them under raptors. Sorry, I just have to point that out that they are not a raptor. <laughs> and let's see, lots of people I have to thank, including Cornell for having me, um, OSU Press for the book, and the University of South Dakota, of course, for um, allowing me to do this research. So I will stop sharing. Thank you, Gretchen. That was wonderful. Um, we had so many questions come into the Q&A while you were speaking, and I've tried to condense them as best I can. And so let's just jump in and ask some audience questions. How about that? Great. Sounds okay. Good. One common question was um, when nighthawks are not nesting on rooftops and when you see them outside of the city, what kinds of places are they nesting on in grasslands, like forests, when we know there's 
we see them not in a city area. Yeah, they well, they will find gravel um, even in a in a forest. So like an open forest, they really like like little gravelly bits. It has to be pretty open forest because they have long wings that um, and they're pretty clumsy in in tight spaces. So they have these sort of giant seagull wings and like a little dove body. So um, they're really acrobatic in the air, but they 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 can't really handle like a lot of tight quarters kind of stuff. Um, so they love gravel in grasslands, in forests, on beaches, um, anything that matches their pattern and the pattern of their eggs. That's so interesting. Um, you talked about this a little bit, but um, another question that we saw was, um, given their habit of nesting on rooftops, are nighthawks experiencing nesting fatalities due to increased temperatures? Yes, I definitely found that. Um, yeah, I, I found like the greatest source of their mortality was uh, unhatched eggs. So they just cooked in their shell and that was, that was the end of it. Um, but I did collect a lot of those eggs and use them for a genetic study. So it, it, it didn't go completely to waste. It was pretty sad sometimes, but, and then occasionally chicks would die in the first couple of days because they couldn't find shade. They weren't very mobile. There was some sort of disturbance where their parents couldn't hang around. And as a follow-up to that, one person did mention, you know, whether there could be some kind of shade or shelter provided for the chicks. And you sometimes see that with beach nesting birds, like a little shade platform that they can get under and hide. I don't know if anybody's ever thought about that for night hawks or if that would work, but that was a suggestion. Yeah, there's actually quite a lot of places for um, night hawks to find shade on rooftops. There's all kinds of things on top of rooftops, little transoms and chimneys and things. The problem is they can't walk until day two. And, and once they can, then they're pretty good at finding that. Okay. Um, how does increasing light pollution affect nighthawks? That's a really good question. I don't know that anyone has studied that. Light pollution. I imagine it, it, it probably bothers them. Um, they're a lot more adaptable than a lot of birds because um, they can fly around during the day. Um, maybe it would affect, well, the thing is they are drawn to light. So a lot of times you can see them in urban areas around um, giant light fixtures at like ballparks or um, malls, mall parking lots, because that's where the insects are. So they, they're probably okay with a fair amount of light. Um, I think they just eat at night because that's when the insects are really out. Okay, thanks for that. Um, one person wants to know, uh, well, I combined two questions. Did you observe crows and or gulls predating their nests on the rooftops? I did not um, observe that, but I had a very interesting incident happen where a bunch of mourning doves uh, mobbed a nest. Um, I, sometimes I give talks and I show like the progression of photos where it's like one dove and then another one and then it's like a mob and they're like staring each other down and they look really benign doves you don't expect them to be predators but um they're they're hungry just like everyone else uh so and then you see like the female sort of opening her mouth and flapping her wings and and they don't they can't really physically fight they can just put on a really good show nighthawks and then and the morning doves just swamped her and then the male shows up and there's kind of a more of a and like a bigger show and then eventually they just both leave because they they just don't have anything to back it up and then when next time i visited that nest there was just no sign of anything no no eggshells no chicks no nothing they just ate it all there was nothing to find and so then i took my camera you know my nest camera home and watched the whole show it was very strange so it's very strange i've never heard anything like that yeah <laughs> very unusual observation um, two people wanted to know about solar panels on a gravel rooftop. Can they coexist? Are there positives and negatives of having solar panels um, alongside common night hogs? Oh, that's another good question. I don't know that anyone has studied that. I have to tell you, Nighthawks are kind of a rare thing to study, uh, especially in the US. So they're not listed here. And so a lot of studies are kind of driven by um, finding funding and also addressing like a critical, um, you know, an animal that maybe, you know, at, at a critical spot. 
um, a lot of the studies for Nighthawks have been done in Canada. Uh, uh, my outside committee member was Mark Brigham out of uh, Regina, Saskatchewan, and all of his students. They do the, a lot of the Nighthawk work. And I don't know that they did a lot of rooftop work. I think I might have been the only rooftop person working at the time. And I didn't have any um, solar panels in South Dakota when I was working, but that would be a fascinating question to answer for sure. You, you may have answered inadvertently another question that was asked, and that was about green roofs. Have, have they been found on green roofs? Did you find any? Does anybody know anything about whether they would use a green roof? Um, so I, I did not encounter any green roofs in, in where I was in, at, in South Dakota. So I, I worked in pretty small towns uh, in southeastern South Dakota. Um, but there, I wish I could remember her name, but there was a graduate student in planning for o University of Oregon. And she did a whole study about green roofs and how um, this this green roof could be adapted for wildlife as well as um, you know, thermal regulation of the building itself. So um, I wish I could remember her name, but <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, so she did a really interesting study about it. I'm not sure if she really ever tested it out, but um, I'm, I'm supporting of that because I think it's an improvement over nothing for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so maybe, um, you know, one kind of question that we could ask Maybe your research didn't necessarily speak to bats, but do you think nighthawks and bats compete in terms of insect food? Yes, I do. Um, there is a colleague of mine named Gabriel Foley. He worked out of the Mark Brigham lab and he did, he wrote a paper about this because he had observed nighthawks and bats foraging at the same time. And what he noticed is that um, when bats are present, nighthawks will fly higher. So in the bird world, oftentimes the advantage is for the smaller, speedier animals. So nighthawks are bigger than North American insect eating bats. So the bats would sort of take the prime location for insects and then sort of force the nighthawks higher in the column to eat. Um, so that was a really interesting observation. Often, and also they don't really overlap that much. So oftentimes I would see nighthawks flying around sunset. And then they, they would kind of lower their activity level once it was fully dark and then the bats would come out. So, you know, this is the idea about resource partitioning in ecology where no two animals can have the same niche. And so among the aerial insectivores, they differ by call size, you know, where they are in the column, air column, and then also the time of day. So interesting question. Glad you asked it. Oh, that was a good question. Um, we have lots more questions and they continue to come in. So you're doing a great job of getting through them. Um, let's switch tracks a little bit and talk about their nesting. Do they mate for life? And do both male and females incubate the eggs? Um, it varies widely. So sometimes there is a male who doesn't hang around at all. Um, he just visits a, a number of nests. Perhaps he mates and just appear, disappears. Some of them are very um very tied to one female like they will just hang out with this one female on this one small roof and go nowhere else or or there's the guy i showed you who had multiple females and then there's like sneaker males who show up and so it is um it's all over the map and it has a lot to do with you know where is the food and how much can i eat and where do i need to go to eat and can i do that all at the same place where i have my female um, how much do I want to protect this site from other males? So it can depend on probably food and also personality of the bird. So each bird, there's a variation in, in behavior between individuals um, in so many species. Okay. How about that camouflage? Does their plumage change based on where, and where they are and what uh, region they're in? For sure. Yeah. So the forest birds tend to be darker. The beach birds tend to be lighter. The Great Plains birds tend to be lighter. Their size also varies. So um, they can be 55 grams in uh, Florida and they can be, um, you know, 
70 grams in South Dakota and 90 grams in the upper boreal forests of Canada. And we know this because of our study where we um, put transmitters on birds and the minimum size of the bird that you needed was 55 grams. And the southern birds sometimes had, we had a hard time getting um, them to be big enough to carry a satellite transmitter. Interesting. Um, we did have a question about the duck stamp. Is that something that the U.S. Post Office carries? Can you buy them at the post office? You can't. They're only, I think they're only sold either, they might be sold online, but they're definitely at the wildlife refuges. If there's a visitor center, then they will sell them. So they're, they're sold primarily um, because if you want to hunt on a refuge, you have to have a duck stamp. Um, but it's also a good idea for birders to own one too. Like, you know, take part in, in supporting your local refuge because it's pretty important too. <laughs> um, here's a question that I really enjoy because it, it looks like it would be true. Can they bite? And obviously like you would probably never get close enough to one to be bitten, but if you were like capturing them and measuring them, did they ever try to bite you? <laughs> no, they never did. Their bills are so, so tiny and so fragile. They have big wide mouths, but it's only the rim of their mouth that actually has um, has a beak. So it's it's mostly pouch. So they really they're not very they're really lightweight birds. They're really not very sturdy. They're 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 kind of a kite, holding like a kite like a very um, feisty kite. <laughs> not a not kite bird, but like actually owning a, a kite. They're really like kind of lightweight and. There's a lot of attitude and nothing else. Their 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 claws are really tiny. They're they're just a whole lot of show. <laughs> Never, I've been bit by other birds, by the way, and uh, you know, gross beaks are really painful. They love this part of your your hand, um, but a nighthawk tries nothing except to scramble away from you. I have had that exact experience with a gross beak. <laughs> Find a nut piece of flesh between the fingers they're very good at that um, I, first time I went miss netting my my co-worker was like oh you get to dig do all the gross beaks and I was like why and he's like oh you'll find out <laughs> <laughs> I love it um okay we have a poop question um but th there's a purpose um has anyone analyzed their poop because um they would like to know what kind of insects they rely upon yeah um there are people collecting poop for genetic studies, I believe. And then there are people who are collecting poop for their diet. So yeah, so their diet really varies upon where they are. Um, they'll eat, you know, beetles in forests. They'll eat mostly, you know, mosquitoes and other diptera, you know, um, in urban areas. It's just, they they can they can digest a lot of kinds of insects. They, um, they, they're really opportunistic. They'll just eat anything. They'll eat moths. They'll eat anything they find, really. I don't I don't know that they have any preferences. If you read, like, their literature about their diet, it's widely varying. Um, they have a really interesting part of their stomach called the cecum. It's like an extra pouch. And not a lot of birds have these. It's like a little extra area where they can digest hard things like chitin and stuff. Um, whereas I think a lot of other birds would kind of spit that chitin up. They... Um, they can digest it, I believe. And um, yeah, I've heard from other people that their poo is really smelly. I did not experience that, but I think it had, might have something to do with what they ate. And in South Dakota, they just ate a lot of mosquitoes, I believe. And other areas, they might have eaten some pretty stinky bugs. <laughs> Maybe stink bugs. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you told us that they eat on the wing, meaning as, you know, as they're flying around and moving. Um, can you maybe go into a little bit more detail about how they eat? You know, we saw that giant mouth. Is it just open on all the time filtering or do they sense when an insect is nearby and catch it? How do they, how do they eat? Yeah. I, you know, with that big mouth, you would think they would just fly around like a whale shark and eat everything. I don't, I don't get close enough to see if they actually do that, but what I do notice is they will make, little minor adjustments as they fly around. So they definitely see their prey and then get it. Um, so I think it's probably a combination of both. Okay. Um, 
We have another question about migration. Do they follow insect migrations when they're migrating? Wow. That's, That's a, a really tough good, one. <laughs> That's a really good question. I bet it has everything to do with it because they, you know, they don't show up until the insects emerge. Um, I, I don't know a lot about migrating insects um, or which ones migrate. And I always think of migrating insects as like monarchs. And I, I don't think they would ever eat a monarch. I don't think they can eat a monarch. Um, but yeah, it, it, yeah, that's a really good question. I would love to know more about insect migration so I can answer that question. I'm sorry. That, that's like my uh, dream job if I couldn't study nighthawks is to study insects, so. Interesting, okay. Yeah, we have just a few more minutes. I'm trying to look through and see if I have missed any more common questions. Um, let's see. We had one question about how did you capture them to put on the transmitter? Very good question. It, um, so we use mist nets, uh, like a lot of birds, we set up these really fine mesh um, nets on these poles. It looks like a, like a volleyball net. Um, and we did it in urban areas. So sometimes you couldn't, you were like in a playground and you couldn't, you know, stake things into the ground. So you made this little contraption where it was freestanding with like a tire on the bottom to sort of anchor it down. and. Um, and, and then we called, we put some really loud nighthawk calls underneath it to attract them. And the, the theory behind mist netting is that you put it in a darkened place where birds don't see it. And then they accidentally fly in with nighthawks. It's a different story. They have really good eyesight. And so they would often fly laps around the net. And by playing the call, we were basically making them mad. You know, we, they would get so mad. They would just fly into the net to sort of attack it. And that's how we would catch them. They're pretty wiped out by the end of it. Poor guys. Hmm. And it was mostly males who we caught because it was kind of aggression focused. Okay. Um, we have another question about um, how do they feed their young? Do they bring live insects and put it in their mouth or do they give them some kind of digested bug mash? How does that work? Do you know? I don't know. I wish I knew. Um, I used to study swallows before nighthawks and they, and they do, swallows do like a combination of things. Like they'll go out and forage for a period of time, maybe 10, 15 minutes. And they'll have like partially masticated insects in their throat and then called a bolus. And then they'll have some live ones sort of hanging out in their bill. And then they'll like slowly stuff, you know, chicks full of both things. And I did this study where I kind of intercepted that and caught the bird at the moment they were about to feed their chick and then removed that from their bill and like stuffed it in a vial to study later. And often I noticed that, you know, it was just like, here's the ball of massive insects and you identify them by little parts and then there'd be like a full, full on insect um, in there. So I, I suspect nighthawks and swallows forage in much the same way. They kind of disappear for 15 minutes and gather everything and then come back. So they might have a combination of dead and life. Hmm. Okay. Um, and then we had a question that you talked a little bit about, and that was how we can help common nighthawks. And you gave us some great tips, like keeping the gravel on the roof and buying a duck stamp and, um, you know, preserving habitat. I also wanted to point out that um, the Cornell Lab has also just recently um, created a guide for how to help aerial insectivores in general. It's not specifically about nighthawks, but it does mention nighthawks. And I'm going to put the link in the chat. And it's called, I think it's called Creating an Insect Buffet for Birds. So this is all just a quick guide to help, and it's free to download, to help you kind of remember some of the things that we can do to help aerial insectivores because it can be a bit challenging to for you know for us individuals to help them um you know because they do eat those flying insects and we need to be having insects for them so with that um we are at eight o'clock uh eastern time so that's that we've reached the end of our hour 
And I wanted to let everyone know that I'll be emailing our attendees tomorrow with the recorded webinar and all of the resources we discussed. Thank you again so much, Gretchen, and to our audience for such great questions. And have a great evening, everyone.